Welcome back to How China Works. This is Brendan Davis, and I'm coming to you today live with our guest on the other end of the line, as well as my co-host, Inging Lee. We have with us today, Professor Dr. Gregory LeBlanc. How are you there, uh, Professor Greg, as they call you in China? Great. Thank you, Brendan. <laughs> Thank you, Yinging. Well, we'd like to Thank start you for being here. We'd like to start by asking you to just give us you have such an extensive biography and resume. Can you give us kind of the short version of your self introduction to people when you meet people who you're trying to um, in, you're going to engage with professionally? Sure. Yes, I, I'm teaching at the University of California at Berkeley. I teach in the business school. Uh, I also teach a little bit of law and, and a little bit of uh, engineering. And um, I'm focused uh, right now a lot on um, the trends that are affecting business, primarily in the areas of data, digital transformation, uh, fintech, um, people analytics, um, generally all of the, the things that, that uh, companies are obsessed with right now right. when it comes to becoming more, more competitive and more innovative. And we have a handful of topics that we've decided to sort of, you know, frame the conversation with. We're going to start focusing on China ed tech. And first, the first question to ask, you have a lot of experience looking through your CV of a lot of engagements with Chinese companies, institutions and whatnot. But have you spent much time in China or have you mostly done that from the comfort of uh, Northern California? <laughs> That's a, that's a great question. Uh, when I tell people that I visited China for the first time in my life just this past year, wow. uh, people are refuse to refuse to believe it <laughs> because <laughs> I've I've always had such a strong interest in in China, and and yet um, uh, we, we've entertained a continual stream of of Chinese business people and students through uh, Northern California through places like like Berkeley. That uh, every time I think about going to China. Um, uh, I have visitors from China that, that intercept me before I have a chance to leave. <laughs> Very nice. So did you, did you have any interesting or like unexpected cultural shock during your trip in China? You know, I didn't really have any cultural shocks. Everything uh, about China was, uh, you know, pleasantly familiar uh, given my interactions with, uh, with Chinese people. Now that's not to say that I didn't encounter uh, plenty of differences between mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, China and uh, and the United States, in particular in California. Um, but, but those differences were ones that that I had uh, grown to expect, um, uh, given given my exposure, uh, because uh, they also were differences that were um, communicated to me by the by the many Chinese visitors that I've hosted. Well, in terms of China EdTech specifically, this sort of ties together a lot of your different interests. And first, can you give us kind of a little summary of what you would consider the state of China EdTech currently? And then what are you engaged in to try to help it uh, help it move along? Yeah, so um, I, I was my, my recent visit, I met with a number of people who are involved in Chinese uh, EdTech. And um, it, it's a massive, massive market. Um it's, I think right now, um, someone told me north of $100 billion a year wow. um, in, in terms of uh, revenue. So it is massive, and I think it is um, bigger than what we have in the United States. Um, and I think this is primarily because, uh, although the education market in the U.S. Is, is very big, and in particular, you know, corporate training is also really, really big, um, the, the U.S. has... Um, done a much better job, I think, when it comes to um, kind of on-the-ground education or in-person education. Mm -hmm. The educational institutions have, have um, I wouldn't say done a perfect job, but have, have done a somewhat better job of, of meeting the needs of, of, the, of the learners. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, you know, this is, this is almost an opportunity for China to, to leapfrog um, uh, the U.S., Mm -hmm. uh, by getting ahead of us with respect to um, delivering content through through different online channels. The, the other thing I'll say is that you know most of the online education in the U.S. is 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 free or close to free, and um, the famous companies uh, edX and, and and Coursera, uh, you know they they've started with this this free model of MOOCs, whereas the the Chinese have from fairly early on realized that they needed to, to generate generate revenue. Um, right. And so 
Um, so they've experimented much more with different types of revenue generation models and different types of, of, of price points and, um, and, and different types of content. Yeah, I actually, um, edX, I'm a fan of edX. I actually had, um, I was part of a program from Harvard Extension where I have a couple of certificates, uh, in, in China related to Chinese history and, you know, ancient history and then kind of more modern culture. So I see the value in that a lot. My question specifically related to that is when it comes to the focal points, between these two different markets when it comes to ad tech uh, development or more specifically training when we were just mentioning about uh, mm -hmm. what what was the impression that you had while you were here or if you have any kind of engagement mm -hmm. talking to ad tech professionals, what was the impression that you have? Well, well the, key, the key difference is that Chinese ed tech right now is focused on the K through 12 market. Um, Whereas in, in the U.S., the, uh, the, the focus is, is on, on higher ed um, and, and corporate education. Um, the, the demand for uh, K through 12 education in, in China is, is just off the charts. The desire that parents have to give their students the, the best quality education, um, that they're willing to make almost any sacrifice uh, for their students. And the, the fact that there is so much demand for supplemental um, education outside of the, the education that they get um, during their normal school. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it, it does say something about the, the, the quality or the style of education that, that the K-12 through students are receiving. I think there's a sense among uh, uh, Chinese parents that, that there's, there's something missing. Um, and so, in, it, well, in the United States, we, we, we continually talk about how um, – you know, China is beating us. They have higher math scores, and 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 there, you know, uh, uh, there's there's a lot of um, paranoia in the United States about um, uh, you know Chinese educational achievement. I, I don't think that's how uh, Chinese parents see it. I think Chinese parents see the the education that their children are receiving as uh, somewhat limiting and and somewhat narrow, mm -hmm. um, and and focused primarily on on passing tests and, and getting admitted to uh, Chinese universities. Um, you know, which, 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 uh, uh, you know, may not be, um, enough for, for people to succeed in, in the modern world. Mm -hmm. Well, there might be opportunities actually for collaboration, especially in this case. Um, when you just mentioned about K-12 education here, and you might know that, uh, Chinese parents would love to, or are willing to spend as much not just money-wise, but like energy, mm -hmm. like focus, you know, any kind of investment they would like to do for their future kids. And most recently, uh, international education, or you can say international, internationalization of the Chinese education uh, have been very hot topics here. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you might heard about it. So in that perspective, what would you see in, in current moment that, uh, what, what do you think China could specific at this moment learn more proactively from the U.S. or vice versa? How could um, educational professionals from the U.S. in some way at this really moment to build um, this particular bridge in solving that problem or issues? Yeah, a uh, great question. Um, so, there's obviously a, a very, very strong demand among uh, Chinese um, parents and, and children to uh, attend universities outside of, of China, whether that be in the United States or in, in the UK or in, in Australia. And I don't think this is driven by simply a desire to uh, you know, learn English and explore other cultures. I think it's driven by an understanding that, the, uh, that there, is, there is an education gap. Um, there is a, a, a big difference between what these um, Western universities offer and what, what the, the Chinese universities offer. Now, I, I will say that, um, you know, I've been teaching for 25 years and uh, some of the best students I've ever had were students that were coming out of Chinese universities mm -hmm. like uh, Tsinghua, Zhao Tong, some of these. I mean, they're, they're phenomenal um, uh, universities in, in China, uh, particularly in, in various uh, technical fields. Um, however, I think that the, on the whole, 
um, there are certain um, qualities that you can get in the uh, Western universities, um, uh, both in, in quality and quantity, that, that are um, less accessible in the Chinese universities. Now, this is not in any way a um, surprising. I mean, for most of the 19th century, Americans sent their um, you know children abroad to uh, Europe to to learn uh, engineering and and various other other topics. Um, but but I think what it, what it's really saying is that the um, the, the approach to education, uh, which is kind of more focused on um, a uh, uh, you know student driven approach, uh, a project based approach, a um, uh, uh, you know more of a um, uh, dialogue approach and, and more of a uh, less of a top down approach. The, these these approaches to education. Um, uh, are, are ones that I think uh, could probably uh, help the Chinese um, educational system uh, if they were to adopt uh, more of these practices. Well, that actually leads to a question that I had noticing, again, from your background, that you have a lot of expertise and frequently speak on the topics of innovation and design and strategy and creativity and so again, I'm going to paint with a giant broad brush here for a second, understanding that that's what I'm doing. But what you just highlighted, you know, in some ways, you said some of the Chinese students are some of the best you have at, at learning certain things, but then the, there are other things that are perhaps lacking or they could learn more from their counterparts. I'm guessing it might be in that direction, but please tell me, what are some of those things that you think would be better to be sort of imported or brought into the system here, which would make them pretty unstoppable, frankly, because they already have the, they already have the, the rote learning and systems thinking. They already have that part pretty well down. I think, what do you think they have to really close the gap? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's great. Um, and I, I don't think that anyone would say that, 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 you know, that, that China is, um, uh, failing to produce uh, creative content. I sure, mean, the, sure. Uh, you know, whether it's, whether it's music or, or video or whatever. And, and there's certainly, you know, an abundance of uh, entrepreneurial, um, uh, uh, zeal in, in, in China with plenty of startups and so forth. But if, if there was a way to kind of improve, uh, the way that people, um, uh, approach things, I, I would say that there needs to be a, a greater emphasis on, um, what we might call, uh, design thinking, right? Mm -hmm. So this right. is something that, uh, you know, we've been, we've been incorporating more and more into every aspect of our education from engineering to business to even law. Um, and, and that's to take a, um, you know, more of a systems approach, uh, more of a, um, a customer driven approach, more of a, let's, let's define the problem first before we jump in and start solving problems. Um, China is, uh, remarkable at, at solving problems. It's, it's absolutely, you know, we need to build a railroad that'll go, you know, super fast over long distances. Mm -hmm. It's like, boom. Yeah. We, you know, boom. It's the, the ability to execute is, is phenomenal. Yeah. Um, but this, this idea of, of, of really figuring out, you know, what people want, figuring out, uh, what, what are the end goals of uh, figuring out all the different possible ways that, that one can, um, uh, think through a problem. I think this is something where, um, it, and it starts very early on at the educational system. This is something that if, if those ways of thinking can be introduced at an earlier stage, um, can lead to an even greater blossoming of, uh, of both entrepreneurship and, and innovation. So, um, again, anecdotally, I would say that the main difference that I see between, say, Chinese students and um, American students um, at the university level is the greater willingness of the uh, American students to um, to question things, mm -hmm. to uh, re refuse to accept something uh, as uh, given knowledge or as given expertise, um, you know, a willingness to, to make arguments, uh, back them up, and then abandon them when they... Uh, uh, fail to yield fruit. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and so that, that, that sort of, uh, uh, willingness to, um, uh, put yourself forward with, uh, with an idea that, that could potentially, um, turn out to be a bad one. <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> I've that, had a that, few of that, those. that, that, that kind of risk it, that kind of, that kind of risk taking in the, uh, in, environment of, 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 of ideas 
is is something which um, you know could probably be encouraged uh, more more aggressively within the the, the educational system. Mm-hmm. Right. With that being said, I guess we already test we already start to touch the leadership in education and uh, talent cultivation. So during your uh, trip or through your observation and engagements with Chinese, not just the students, but maybe young entrepreneurs here, you must have noticed that China um, is putting a great investment in cultivating entrepreneurs uh, national-wide. And it's very important at this moment, we look both inside and outside of China to find a better formulas when it comes to the to thrive in more fields in tech innovation. So at this current moment, what do you think that um, like for the typical, if you we consider entrepreneurship is a culture, so what specifically uh, could entrepreneurs from different cultures at this moment to learn to to even to think about this moment, what is the next generation? of entrepreneurship and is that any particular uh, thoughts or particular solution in your mind that could help to foster this type of uh, collaboration or discussion? Yeah, I mean, I will say China and Silicon Valley are probably two of the most entrepreneurial uh, cultures that that I know. Um, So um, when we're comparing them with other parts of the world, they are clearly um, at the the top of the stack. Um, But if we wanted to... um, make the Chinese entrepreneurial um, ecosystem even, even stronger. Mm-hmm. I think there are a couple of, of things that, that could be, could be done. Um, now some of them are, 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 are legal um, and uh, have to do with um, investor protections and incorporation and contract law. Um, because I think that um, in China uh, it's, it's very difficult to engage in uh, arm's length uh, contracting. Mm-hmm. Um, there's there's really a strong mm-hmm. reliance on 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 trust. Um, there's a really, really I mean people people um, know who they can trust and who they can't trust. Um, people in in the Silicon Valley are are much more willing to trust um, complete strangers right. um, because of the legal protections uh, and also because of the, the reputations. People are are very um, you know the, people know everybody. Uh, and and they you know they they people are concerned about their reputation so so reputations and uh, legal protections um, make it much easier for you to uh, uh, change business partners and, and suppliers and uh, customers and partners uh, very rapidly and they, they don't need to invest a huge amount of time in, in getting to know uh, your counterparties um, and and the other thing is I think um, uh, you know c- culturally. Um, the entrepreneurial uh, world is one that simply does not respect hierarchies. There, there's no, there's right. no hierarchies. Um, and I think in, in, you know, Chinese culture is still very much concerned with, with hierarchies and mm-hmm. every mm-hmm. social gathering, it's important to know who's the, you know, who's the, the, the big person and who's the small person and, you know, and, 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 you know, everyone starts off in the same spot, but then, um, potentially as an entrepreneur, but then very quickly, uh, people are, are reaching for those more traditional, uh, organizational forms. And, and I think that, uh, that, that's something that, that is, is, can be a deterrent because the organizational form in entrepreneurship never has time to congeal. The minute right. it congeals and one person is the, is the, the boss, well, that person, you know, needs to be the, <laughs> there's a ticking clock the, you know, from the, there the CEO needs, somewhere else. Right. Well, the CEO has to be able to be willing to, you know, clean the toilets and, and, and stuff if you want to be a startup. Oh, um, okay. and, uh, and they, and, and, for, and more importantly, they have to know how to listen to everybody in the organization because you never know where you're your, talking your about the Valley now. <laughs> you're talking about the Valley. Yes, my, head, my head was I'm in sorry. China because this is, uh, we, and we were talking offline before, before we got onto the actual show here that, um, you know, and we're glad that you listened to the show. And so you're probably aware that our season one covered pretty much all these kind of moves, these cultural things, such as yes. the high context yes. communication and Guanxi and the, the hierarchy. Yeah. Did you, you probably knew a lot of that anyway. Did you, did you yeah, hear well, any of that on our season one well, by any chance? 
<laughs> was that useful for you? I, if you heard of some course of that? I did. I, I, <laughs> but I, 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 I wish I had listened to it before I visited China uh, because, you know, so do we, you know, one of the things that you, one of the things you covered on season one, I, I remember uh, experiencing very vividly where everyone was trying to um, uh, get their, their, their mouth high glasses lower than mine. And, and I was, I was, uh, you know, I, I was almost the guy that, that wanted to get on the floor just to uh, out lower <laughs> you, them. Uh, did, did you almost do that? But, That's but, great. But then, well, <laughs> but I, the look on their the look on their faces were were, were, were kind of uh, shocking that I was not you know I was refusing to go along with the uh, uh, or refusing to appreciate the respect that they were they were showing me. Mm. Um, uh, you know, Americans are are, are often uncomfortable with um, people. Uh, showing them excessive uh, respect, um, yeah, <laughs> and and so and so this this was this was um, this is something I it's a, it's a it's a big big difference totally um, you know where 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 the, the 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 we have this thing uh, in a lot of companies in, in the valley called you know all hands right. and all hands means that the CEO will uh, have a, a you know a um, open forum where everyone in the organization is is welcome to ask questions and sometimes they're difficult questions and uh the right. ceo is not um can't just sort of say shut up this is the way it is yeah uh, they have to um you know they have to essentially address these questions and speak to the even the lowest person in the organization as 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 some, something of an equal yep Right. Well, interestingly, having been a valley girl <laughs> for a while <laughs> and I really vividly imagine or recall the memory of being in two different cultures when it comes to, you know, this kind of meeting and interaction. So here in China, well, right now I'm here in Beijing. The entrepreneurship culture is also very strong, um, but it's a little different from time to time. It's kind of like, a, a, depend on the community and places, are a lot of people are also have been to Silicon Valley, leave them over there and come back. But overall, here, um, in the, the typical Chinese mind uh, when you're doing business, so there's uh, something beyond respect, and that is called li. This uh, You can say the politeness, but more accurately, it's uh, the uh, um, ethnic, you know, this part of ethics. Oh, I have difficulty mm. pronouncing this. Uh, Brandon has to correct uh, me uh, like Is that. this uh, uh, ethics? Is this the word we're going for? <laughs> so that's Eti oh, uh, it, uh, etiquette etiquette that's the word we're going for etiquette, <laughs> etiquette. <Yeah. laughs> right 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 so in our mind we believe that we showcase that is a way of respect and so that will eventually lead us to the success of our relationship mm -hmm. yeah a little bit culture here yes etiquette is not something that is in excessive supply in silicon valley <laughs> we'll say that Right. And then, hey, can I borrow your lighter, bro? People are, people can, <laughs> yeah, people can be very, uh, <laughs> very, very, very blunt and, and very uh, uh, forward and, and, and to the point and uh, often do not ask, uh, you know, uh, how you're doing or how your family's doing. Yeah. Well, in another way, I always think of this as an interesting contrast. Um, what you just mentioned, like, when people call you, hey, you, or someone call me YY in, or in, <laughs> or instead of uh, Mrs. or Miss or like with a big title, that saves time. And, and, and we can go directly to the point. I mean, why not sometimes <laughs> if we are actually both in a hurry and, uh, you know, just rushed into the meeting and why, why don't we go through it, right? I, I always think about why don't we do that? <laughs> yeah, I think, um, well, I think it's, it's more than just... Um, uh, time saving. I, I think it, it reflects uh, an inherent um, uh, a little bit of suspicion or um, uh, skepticism about um, expertise. Mm -hmm. So, right. um, in in my classroom, you know, I teach MBAs, and they, of course, they 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 do have. Um, they're there for a reason, and they do understand that that there may be some knowledge that professors have. Um, that they don't have and that they'd like to get that. But on the other hand, they, they also are, um, the professor needs to prove himself or herself right. um, because they're not willing to 
uh, except the fact that just because you're behind the podium, that mm-hmm. means that you, you know, have all the answers. Right. Uh, they're, they're, they're naturally, and I think justifiably, um, skeptical of received wisdom. Yep. And so, um, and so there is this, this, uh, flattening of the, of the hierarchy. And for me, I find that beneficial because I, my goal, uh, when I go into the classroom as a professor is I, I hope to learn as much as I teach. Um, mm-hmm. I, my, st- I see my students as a source of insight and wisdom, you know, they're out in the field doing things that, that I'm not doing. And, and so I, I view myself more as a, um, recycler of, mm-hmm. of knowledge where I learn things from the students, which I then turn around and convey to, uh, you know, to other students. Um, and, and when I go, to, when I'm with a, a Chinese audience, uh, I think they expect that the professor is the. Uh, source of 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 knowledge and and wisdom. So, and I think that can, um, you know, that can that can make the dialogue a little bit less fruitful. I completely agree, and I I understand this really personally because I taught in an MFA film program in LA for six years, and I've also done a lot of guest speaking and consulting in those programs here. And the difference is exactly as you described. And I don't know if you've had this experience, but. Uh, I mean, there's the well-known thing of the imposter syndrome, where if you feel like you're being inauthentic, you know, basically here you're expected to play the role of someone who is a bit more upright Mm -hmm. and stuffy, even if you're used to from a Western system being more relatable and transparent and admitting your your fallacies or what you don't know. And so you're given respect based on how candid you are, as opposed to let me roll out my long list of credentials and you should be impressed because so given that given the obvious policy legal issues, there are these baked in cultural things. We know the potential here in China. You were just highlighting that at the beginning. How do you see us bridging these gaps? What do you, you know, how do you see making this work? What's kind of the tack that you're taking right now, at least? Well, part of it I think is, is about leadership and, um, uh, assuming a new style of, of leadership where in the, in the U S we talk a lot about leaders as coaches, mm-hmm. um, leaders as, as mentors, um, and not leaders as bosses. And I right. think, um, that that's one way I think just setting an example when people do have respect and they are respected, uh, you know, they can, uh, slightly alter the, the terms of conversation by, um, treating their employees uh, and their students say with, with, with respect. And, um, and I think that will uh, set the tone um, all, all the way down. Um, the other more issues with respect to education, you know, it's a little bit, it's a little bit more difficult to get people to move away from, you know, credentialism mm-hmm. um, in the United States just today, uh, you know, Google and Facebook uh, announced that they will no longer, um, uh, pay much attention to uh, the the degree that you have when you're applying for a job there. Um, they'll no longer pay attention. They don't really care what school you went to, or even if you completed your uh, degree. This is this is uh, this is a fairly um, aggressive move, um, and uh, I think it runs flies in the face a bit with what it's going in China. It seems to be moving a little bit in the opposite direction, where uh, the the pressure on um, young people is to just accumulate as much uh, as many degrees with uh, from prestigious universities as, as possible um, because I don't think that either they feel confident or employers feel confident in uh, evaluating uh, people um, you know using using other criteria yeah I mean companies could potentially uh, begin to set examples by um, you know paying more attention to the individual and what the individual brings to the table I was I was going to ask. Well, you just mentioned about a word um, cre- uh, credit credibility. Like, a cre- what is what is the original word you use, Professor uh, Greg? Um, the no idea. <laughs> so what? Creden- literally- creden- credentials. Right. Credentialism. Creden- so this particular word might be viewed differently from the East and the West. What I observe here in China, well, I don't know how to explain, but I feel sorry a lot of times when we focus too much on certificates. 
It's just a certificate, the 证书 in Chinese. I'm not、mm. sure how much you get involved, engaged, or in in conquering this,、uh, professor. But、mm. you might have,、uh, because、um, there's a lot of Chinese students. The the path for a young student to grow, and I think for a lot of Chinese parents who are from the 60s and 70s. And in the 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 whole point, the whole point of life, the whole point of meaning in life is to cultivate their next generation talent and the best talent in their family. So, so from primary school to junior school, and after junior school, they have either high school or university, or they go to international school. What do you think? But wherever you go, you find students are surrounded with this、uh, shadow of、uh, credential economy.、Yeah. I, I would, I don't know what is better term to to quote it, but、uh, you might have some.、Uh, maybe you have might have some of your observation. But I would like to know that at this point, how could we、um, focus on authentic、um, educational performance? Uh, when it comes to the evaluation of students, and like you, you might have some particular experience for that. Yeah, I mean, this is not something that's that that, that is unique to China. I, I think、um, you know, in in every situation, people are trying to figure out what、um, someone can bring to the table. And、um, as an employer,、um, you know, you really want to employ the best people. And so, how do you know who they are? How do you know who the best people are?、Um, Oftentimes, it means that you have to、uh, give them an opportunity to to show themselves.、Um, often, it means taking a look at what they're capable of, looking at what they've done, what their accomplishments are.、Um, and I think, you know, with with startups, that's way more important.、Um, in a large organization,、um, no one ever gets. They say no one gets fired for for、uh, for hiring IBM, right? Well, no one gets fired for. Hiring Stanford or Berkeley or Harvard,、um, and so even if the person turns out to be no good,、um, you know the, the the person who made the decision to hire them is is off the hook because of the the credentials.、Um, in, in a startup environment, nobody cares. Startup environment, it's all about you know what do you bring to the table. So so I think、um, the startup ecosystem has the opportunity to、um, break down some of this、um, because you can show. Uh, that that people are capable of of building out companies and being successful in these companies,、um, regardless of 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 how many credentials they have. Now, that's not to say that credentials are meaningless, and it's not to say that cre- having these credentials does not correlate with with having capabilities. Sure. sure. But I, I also think that、um, you know, when in a world where talent is really really scarce,、um, it makes a lot of sense to. Do your homework and、uh, you know figure out who really does have the the talent,、uh, rather than just falling back on some easy, simple、uh, box checking、uh, exercises. Well, I've even seen that here in some of the.、Uh, I mean, I'm not engaged in teaching, you know, as a profession here currently, but、um, from a lot of friends who do at the top schools. It makes sense if you're teaching, you know, certain hard sciences, but they have, they often want film instructors to actually have a doctorate. Do you know how? Do you know how many? I could I could invite the people with a doctorate in film into my studio apartment right now. <laughs> you know, it's 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 one of the lowest. Cri- there's almost no correlation between people who have any real world experience and who have a doctorate in my particular field. So、mm-hmm. again, this is this is this kind of gap that I see as one of those big challenges to overcome. How do you think that? Do you think that 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 advances in ed tech where you can show demonstrable results? Do you think moving to a place where we're looking at results instead of credentials is going to help to change that?、Uh, absolutely, and、um, you know, so one of the startups that I'm involved with right now is is, is a company that、um, uh, offers people a way of learning、uh, software engineering and software development、uh, without any professors、um, whatsoever. And so it's a basically a form of of peer learning,、mm-hmm. um, and、uh, it's been a very very successful、uh, approach and a very successful method.、Uh, and the people who go through this program are、um, almost guaranteed to find jobs
uh, you know, working for, for tech companies. Uh, but at the end of the day, the credential is not a piece of paper. It's, uh, it's, it's work product, right? It's, mm-hmm. you know, you've actually completed these coding exercises and, um, and, and you can demonstrate that you've, you've, you've completed these, these coding exercises. Um, and, uh, employers can even assign you various coding exercises and say, here, go do this. Uh, and, um, and then get back to us and show us what you've done. Um, and so that, that, that is replacing the job interview <laughs> as a, as a way of evaluating, mm-hmm. um, talent. So mm-hmm. I think at that level, when it comes to software engineering, software development, you know, coding, um, we actually have real ways of evaluating uh, talent, and and that's that's gradually starting to uh, take over in 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 that space. Um, and it doesn't really matter if you have a CS degree uh, or not from from a top top university mm-hmm. if you can demonstrate objectively that you have the competencies. Now, of course, there are other talents that are much less uh, easy to demonstrate through. Um, some kind of exercise like that, mm-hmm. particularly, you know, managerial talent and, mm-hmm. and, uh, um, you know, organizational talent, that's the, and creative talent, that's stuff that you have to somehow assess in, in other ways. Um, but as more and more jobs in, in, you know, are in, in the kind of software space, I think we'll, we'll see these, these new techniques take over. And that's where ed tech can be, can be very, very helpful because then people can, uh, learn, uh, skills, um, uh, rather than uh, get get degrees. Uh, let's just shift the gear a little bit. I noticed that uh, you constantly speak about a tech innovation, more specifically on fintech. So what are your key viewpoints on the fintech development or uh, more specifically connect with the people operations um, both in the United States and China? Uh, if there's any differences or similarities that impress you most? Yeah, I'll talk about uh, both of those things. So, with respect to to fintech, um, you know, there are areas that where China is so far ahead of the United States, it's it's ridiculous. Um, when I tell people in the United States who are unfamiliar with China about the the omnipresence of of WeChat Pay and Alipay, mm-hmm. um, they're they're astonished. They they really find it hard to believe that cash has more or less been squeezed out of the Chinese economy because in the U S we've been trying to pr- promote mobile payments, you know, for, 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 for years. Um, and even in, even with Apple pay and, and Google wallet, the number one, um, mobile payment system in the U S is Starbucks. Mm-hmm. Right? <laughs> right. I mean, Think about that. And the only thing you can buy with Starbucks is, is coffee. And yet right. it's the more people use Starbucks uh, mobile payment system than use Apple Pay, which is you know astonishing that we still have people use using using cash um, in, in the US. So there there are some ways that China is just so far ahead of of the US, particularly at, at the consumer level. And and I will say that you know most of the tech innovation in China is really um, c- consumer oriented, mm-hmm. um, you know, and WeChat obviously is and Tencent and Alibaba are, you know, clearly at the forefront of that type of innovation. Um, and yet I would say overall with respect to FinTech um, innovation, um, the, uh, uh, the U S is, is, is far ahead and primarily in, in the area of, of say, you know, enterprise um, the, the Chinese banking system, for instance, uh, is is a real source of concern for for me, and I'm, I'm not alone. I think there's a lot of people that are concerned about the, the Chinese uh, banking system and its um, the its use of uh, uh, technology is just one aspect of it. Um, and and you know the, the the reason why they've been a little bit slower to adopt the technology is is because of regulatory and policy and and, and legal and incentive reasons where the banks are not. Um, as independent and they sort of have a safety net and there's a lot of kind of governmental, um, you know, supervision, uh, in, in, in the, in the, uh, in the banking sector. Um, and so the, the innovations that we've seen in, in, in the U S around, uh, FinTech, I think are a little bit more 
uh, more pervasive. Now that said, mm-hmm. you know, companies like Ping On are doing really, really exciting stuff. Um, you know, Ali and, and Tencent are, are moving into pretty much every aspect of, of finance. And, and I like to say that the strongest banks in China are actually not banks. They're tech companies. Um, mm-hmm. Whereas in the U.S., the, the, the tech companies, the, the banks are, you know, doing a pretty good job of fending off the tech companies, uh, but perhaps not for long. And I, I expect that Facebook and Amazon are going to follow in the footsteps of, of, of Tencent and, and Ali mm-hmm. at, at some point. So I, I think that the, the financial system, which is really the uh, circulatory system of the economy, it is the, the lifeblood of the economy. Uh, the financial system in China is really um, perhaps the the, the, the the part the aspect of the economy that worries me the most um, because of the uh, the exposure that the the banks have mm-hmm. to um, to asset values um, and it does it does trouble me it, it does make me uh, concerned about um, you know the the, the long term stability of the of the financial of the, of the financial system. Um, uh, on the other hand, when we talk about, you were talking about people operations, um, look, I think working for a Chinese company is very different from working for an American company. Um, both economies have a desperate, uh, shortage of, of talent, certain types of talent. And, uh, there's a massive turnover. So if you're, for instance, a software engineer, software developer in China, you're, you're, you're going to be moving jobs very frequently in Silicon Valley, you're going to be moving jobs very frequently. Um, I do think that in Silicon Valley, there's a much greater attention paid to the um, the, the employee, much greater attention paid mm-hmm. to how to get the most and the best out of your employee and to treat the employee uh, in a way that, that, that uh, makes them really want to work there. Uh, there are a lot of uh, Chinese employees, I, I think, that are uh, more susceptible to, to burnout and to uh, you know, the nine nine six ethic is 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 something that I think um, in the long run will uh, be detrimental to to companies um, because it, it doesn't really encourage the the, the long term sustainable uh, productivity of the yeah, employee health, <laughs> health of the employee yeah mental, mental physical health, emotional physical health. Yeah. Yes. And I think I think <laughs> Chinese things companies like that. are going to have to. Uh, yeah, they're going to start competing on. And look, I mean, I'm not just saying that American employees work less because they don't. I mean, no, exactly. San Francisco, everybody works, but it's it's the 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 companies are very cognizant of uh, the um, the 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 um, the high the the high degree of competition, and they're competing along other dimensions, and they're competing along. Uh, workplace quality, right. um, you know, workplace environment, you know, w- workplace culture, uh, and wellness. Wellness is becoming a, a huge uh, concern for 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 employers, um, and so th- so that I think is some some an area where where China has a lot to uh, uh, a lot to learn and could potentially um, uh, enhance the, the productivity of their employees through through greater attention to uh, their needs. Well, and, this and their is. Lives. Uh, Sorry, I didn't mean to step on the end of what you just said, but I I think we we heard that I as we're sort of moving toward the home stretch here, I, we want to ask you one fairly high level and open ended question that will let you express sort of your your own philosophy of this without too many constraints from us. Because what you said, for instance, just now to me, that's you know that's a difference in evolution of that type of culture where there's a respect for talent versus thinking well this is it's still a, a vestige of the factory thinking of there's more people behind you who can take this job whereas mm-hmm. there's you know talent is respected at a more esoteric level and and health is respected at a more you know workers rights unionized kind of level um what do you think when you look ahead, given your broad experience and you track in business law, economics, education, you track in a lot of areas professionally with with those credentials that are actually very important. When you look ahead in the next, say, three to five years, we like to keep it positive. So I'll ask you to end on your best case scenario. But what do you sort of see as like the biggest challenge or maybe the worst case possibility? But then what do you what do you hope is the best case outcome of this evolution of, 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 of 
technology and innovation and cooperation between our societies that you're so involved in? Well, first of all, I'll say I'm, I'm extremely uh, optimistic. Um, I'm very, um, uh, the, 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 Progress, I think, that both uh, the U.S. and China have made in the last, uh, you know, 15 years is just phenomenal. Um, mm. And, you know, I expect to see both of these uh, trends continue. And I expect, in spite of the stuff that we see in the headlines, uh, where, you know, in the, in the kind of political back and forth, I, I think that, you know, business leaders in both countries and political leaders in both countries understand that the U.S. and China are, are going to be um, – you know, working together and learning from each other for, for the next couple of decades. Um, now I do think that, 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 you know, there are some, uh, bottlenecks and, and, and constraints that can impede the, the, the further development. Um, and so the, the warning I would probably provide to, to China, I mean, is the cautionary note is that I'm old enough to remember back in the early nineties when the U S, um, Discussion was very similar to what it is now, where uh, everyone said Japan is going to take over uh, the world and Japan is going to be lead right. in every category mm-hmm. and Japan is going to, um, you know, yeah, dominate. I remember, I remember, I remember this too. All the American assets. I remember this too. Yeah. And <laughs> what happened um, to that? And then, and then, and then it just sort of disappeared. And, um, and this wasn't because of any American policies and tariffs yeah. or anything like that. It was really because. There were inherent um, limitations, structural limitations to the, the the Japanese economy, the way it was organized, that made it um, difficult for them to be as as nimble as they needed to be to keep up with um, you know changing technologies. And I think uh, you know China is obviously a very different system from from Japan. Sure. And China has demonstrated. And the leadership in, in China has demonstrated, uh, you know, a, a, a willingness uh, to um, kind of improvise on, on the fly and, and, and allow for, uh, you know, a thousand flowers to bloom in, in a variety mm-hmm. of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but, the, but, but ultimately, I, I do think that certain structural changes uh, will, will have to happen. Um, and those are, um, you know, obviously people talk about the macroeconomic um, structural changes. I, I'd like to focus a little more on the, the, the legal uh, changes. I, I do think that the legal system in China is a, a point of weakness. Um, I was there recently giving a talk where I highlighted that uh, on a per capita basis, uh, China has uh, like, you know, 2% uh, as many lawyers as we have in the United States. Um, and, you know, this is like having an engine with no, with, with no oil, I mean, if you have an engine with no oil, it's going to ultimately seize up and uh, and stop driving because, um, you know, lawyers and, and the legal system is is how um, how companies can interact and uh, and contract. And it's it's a lot cheaper and easier than, than, than you know, going out to dinner every night and, and, and drinking Mao Tai. <laughs> um, and so, I, 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 you know, which is yeah. which is the substitute for. Uh, you know, just doing a deal. So I think, I think that, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's better for your health too, to hire yes. a lawyer. Um, so I, I think that, I think that the, the legal system has to, has to, and by the way, Japan has the same issue. Japan has, has, you know, very few lawyers. Um, and, and so, you know, the, the legal, this is, I'm talking about private law. Now, of course yeah. there's other stuff related to public law, um, and, and regulatory, um, law and stuff, but I think they're all, they're all related. So I, I think that, uh, careful attention to the legal system and really the development of a, a solid bar, uh, and increasing the, the number of lawyers and the quality of, 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 of the legal system, um, and enhancing, uh, uh, you know, shareholder rights and, and, um, and employee rights and, and stuff like that. I think that's, that's an area of, of huge opportunity. There's lots of, there's, there's trillions of dollars of, of wealth that can be unlocked, in my view, mm-hmm. um, uh, if, 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 if those changes were to be made. And then, of course, there's all the macroeconomic stuff, which has already been, I think, well discussed by others. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got to say, you touched on that, and I think Inge and I are both uh, 
smiling ear to ear because that is such a under uh, under discussed topic for a lot of reasons but that is i think i think you're really on to something there and we would love to do a follow up with you sometime uh professor leblanc where can people find out more about you what are the best places to track you down online via linkedin or a website what's what's the best for you yeah i mean uh linkedin is 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 a way to go um the best best easiest way to find me is on on linkedin take a look there every now and then and uh, you'll see i have i have a couple of videos up on there that give a taste of kind of what what i do um you know my 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 favorite uh thing is to actually um interact with uh with you know live business people <laughs> in, a, in a in a business setting and and i love to uh uh you know talk to people whether in china or in um silicon valley well, Professor LeBlanc, okay. really appreciate your time. We could talk to you for hours, I think, right, Inge? Right, ab- absolutely. I learned a lot. Well, thank you. It's, uh, I'm, I've been enjoying the show a lot, so it's, I'm really glad to uh, contribute in some way. And um, we look forward to your more, uh, more of your cross-cultural insights in the future, and welcome to China again. And thank you, listener, for joining us this week. We'll be back next week with another episode of How China Works. <laughs>